Hello, friends, and welcome back to Malicious Compliance Stories. Let's start our video with a short and sweet wedding story that the OP won't forget for a very long time. So don't forget to subscribe to our channel if you're new here, and turn on notifications so you don't miss a new video every single day. Here we go. Could you get me a white wine? When I was about 25 and an officer in the Navy, I was in the wedding of a friend in the Marine Corps. I was the only naval officer there and I wore my formal tuxedo-like dinner dress uniform for the ceremony. It's a very dark blue, really black uniform. The Marines were all in their dress uniforms as well. At the reception, I decided to chat up the sister of the bride. I walked over to her and said hello and she looked at me and said, could you get me a white wine? I said, sure and went to the open bar and got her a drink. I came back and handed it to her, and she said thank you, turned around, promptly resumed talking to her friends, and completely ignored me. I was a little miffed, as you can imagine, but I went away and found some of my other friends. A couple weeks after the wedding, I was talking to the bride, and she was surprised that her sister did that. It turns out that, based on my uniform, she thought I was a waiter, and when I brought her her drink, she figured our interaction was complete. My Marine Corps buddies have never let me live that down, I can assure you. Be happy. You got promoted from taxi driver to waiter. And our second story. Lady said her child needed to go to the hospital. I'm an RN. A few years ago, I was working at a public walk-in clinic in the middle of downtown in a large Canadian city. Now, as a walk-in clinic nurse, I'm used to a lot of entitlement from patients those who believe that they can jump the line of other people who've been waiting five plus hours to see the doctor simply because their symptoms are more important. Those that don't understand that when we say we have closed registration early in order to be able to close at our official time of 9.30 p.m., it means that they can't be seen even if it's only 8 p.m. when they come in. Those that have become verbally and physically abusive towards me if they don't get their way. A lot of the doctors that worked with me seemed to have a lot when faced with patients' ire. So if I told the patients that they couldn't be seen due to the clinic policy of wanting its employees to actually get to sleep before having to come back the next morning, they would attempt to go around me and appeal to the doctor who would inevitably cave. This angered me on a lot of levels. Firstly, these doctors were simply rewarding this disgustingly selfish behavior by capitulating. Secondly, they were lending credence to the belief that a lot of patients had I was a mere subordinate to the doctor and not my own autonomous practitioner. Thirdly, I was nurse manager of this clinic. The doctors were on call at the behest of the clinic and as such did not technically have authority upon our hours as nursing staff and receptionists. Fourthly, we're supposed to act as a united team. So one particularly trying night, a lady came in with her toddler child. She came in around 8.45 and we still had another two hours of people waiting to be seen. We closed registration at 6 p.m. and were not accepting any new patients. I'm in the back of the clinic performing a wound cleaning when the receptionist calls me and asks me to come up front as there's an aggressive patient demanding their child be seen. So I head out to the front, the lady standing at the desk, arms folded, snapping at her child to sit still. I glance at the child who's sitting on a chair, swinging their legs and babbling away happily to anyone who'll listen. Eyes bright, smiling, laughing, doesn't look unwell. I think to myself as a cursory assessment. As soon as the lady sees me with my stethoscope, she launches her tirade. Doctor, my child is extremely unwell. She has asthma and can barely breathe. She needs to be seen immediately. I glance deadpan back at the child who's singing loudly to herself. I look back to the lady. She doesn't seem to be in distress, ma'am. The lady tenses up and stares at me as though I'm a complete effing moron. Well, where the hell did you go to medical school? She inquires with the auditory level of a banshee. Kids present very differently than adults when they can't breathe. What are you, 12? I walk over to the child and place my hand gently on her back. I count her respirations as she falls quiet under my touch and I observe her scapulae as they expand and contract, indicating full chest expansion. I listen to the smooth sounds of her inspiration and expiration audible even without a stethoscope. I observe the moistness of the conjunctivae as she rubs her eyes, and I see the glistening wetness of her tongue as she licks her lips. She's well hydrated. 
I'm not a doctor, I'm a nurse, I say, as I plug my stethoscope into my ears and begin to listen to the child's lung fields. Of course you don't know what you're doing, she yells. I didn't bring my ill child to see some stupid nurse. I demand to see a doctor now. She needs to go to the hospital, and if she gets worse, I'll have your license. Child's lung sounds are perfect. I lean down and smile at the child. How are you feeling, I ask her. She wants my stethoscope. I hand it to her. I'm bored, she says, understandably. I look to the lady. Registration closed some time ago because, as you can see, we have many patients to see and will end up being here past closing. I'm afraid that we cannot see your child today. Based on my physical assessment, I cannot triage her up the line as she does not seem to be in respiratory distress. There are several hospitals close by that I can direct you to if you wish. A slow purple flush begins to crawl over her features. I smile blandly at her as I await the inevitable crap storm about to erupt. She walks up to me and leans into my face. I stand my ground, staring non-committally back. The rest of the waiting room is staring intently. Get the effing doctor. The doctor's seeing patients, ma'am. I cannot interrupt him. My child is going to die because of you, you disgusting, low-educated piece of filth. Get the effing doctor. I'm about to repeat my previous statement when I suddenly hear a slight cough behind me. It's the doctor. Internally, I sag. Great. He's going to usher them in, and I get to look like an idiot in front of everyone again. What seems to be the problem, he asks, staring quizzically at the lady. She rushes over to him and clings to his arm. Oh, thank God, doctor. My child, she has asthma, and she's run out of her puffers and is in an attack. This nurse refused to let her see you. The doctor stands there, resolute, and disentangles his arm from her vice grip. He takes a cursory glance at the child, who has begun delightedly listening to her own stomach with my stethoscope. He then walks over to me. Now, this is a doctor whom I've not met before tonight. I prepare for the worst. Nurse, I assumed you performed triage. I nod. Yes, I say. I do not see any evidence of respiratory distress. Lung sounds. Non-adventitious, I say. Fancy way of saying clear as F. Mucous membranes? Fancy way of asking about hydration status. Pink, moist. Capillary refill? Fancy way of asking about blood flow. Immediate. The doctor turns towards the lady, and this is when I realize that he's been watching this entire exchange from the beginning. I'm calling you an ambulance. The lady blinks. What? Why? You said she needed to go to the hospital. If that's what you think, you know your child better than I do. I'd rather be safe than sorry. This lady looks nonplussed, but, but the nurse said that she isn't in distress. The doctor smiles humorously. What, this nurse right here? The one you were accusing of negligence and lack of knowledge? I trust this nurse's assessments. She's been very perceptive and professional for the long night that I've had the fortune to work with her. However, she, like myself, cannot know the intricacies of your child's history. It would be negligence indeed if we were to dismiss your concerns as a parent. Nurse, please call the ambulance. Unable to keep the crap-eating grin off my face, I walk to the phone. The lady's trying to argue with the doctor who's walking away. Best of luck to you, ma'am. I'm sorry that you had to wait so long, but it's best that we leave this to the professionals. And a shame it is, too, as this is flu season and all the emergency departments are full to bursting with people waiting to be seen. Prepare for a very long wait. And with that, he returned to the examination rooms. I hung up after exiting the call with EMS. The lady was visibly shaking. A few smiles littered the faces of those watching. EMS should be here shortly. If your child's status worsens, please have my receptionist call me back out. Have a good night, ma'am. Vindication has never felt so sweet. And our last story. Guilt Trip Parking Lot. So I live in Paris, right next to the Seine, the river who passes through Paris. Due to construction work, this point is important, our outside parking is nearly unattainable. And since there's a big concert hall not so far, a lot of people tend to park everywhere on this parking, pavement included. At the end of my workday around 8 p.m., when I enter in the parking, I see one of my new neighbors, let's call her old lady, OL, right behind me in the entrance looking for a place too. We both look everywhere, and I spot the last room on a really big pedestrian crossing where there's already a car on it, but enough space for another. To be clear, this pedestrian crossing leads to nowhere accessible for pedestrian due to fence put by the construction worker. 
It'll be here from the end of 2017 to mid-2022. So I took the spot, and as I go out of my car, O.L. starts shouting at me. O.L., you should be ashamed to park here. Just think about our handicapped neighbor. I know this neighbor very well since he lives next door to me, and I take his dog out nearly every week when I go out with mine. Plus, there's only one handicapped spot in our parking, and everyone knows it's for him. And I'll add, I know him well since it's the owner of the restaurant right under our apartment complex. I'm not a confrontational person, and since this neighbor's pretty new here, I just moved to park my car nearly 10 minutes walk from home to avoid any conflict. But what did I see when I'm about to enter the building? O.L. parked her car in the spot I should be ashamed to park. This bee just guilt-tripped me to take my spot. At this point, I was fuming. It's what you got trying to be good. I started calling a towing company, but in the middle of the call, I noticed the second car on the big pedestrian crossing was the car of my second floor neighbor, who's a really nice dad of three, and I didn't want to put him in this. The night passed, and in the morning, when I was about to leave, I got in the elevator with my second floor neighbor. I tell him what happened the day before, and we both laughed, but as we go outside, what do we see? The OL's car still on the pedestrian crossing with my neighbor's car, but now the parking is nearly empty. So I asked my neighbor to move his car to be on a legal spot, and I immediately call a towing company from the city behind the river. It takes them a lot of time to cross it. My second floor neighbor said to my fiance that the OL came to his apartment asking if he got his car towed too, and she told him that he said, no, I would be ashamed to park on a spot like this one. I would have paid a fair price to see her karma face. You sound like a really good neighbor. Hopefully you won't hear too much from OL in the future. Hey guys, thank you all for watching the video. I'll see you in the next one.